Good evening. Let's all stand together and let's worship the Lord. Oh 
now, Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Jesus. seated.
Let's all stand together. Take two minutes to greet one another.
kind of a painful but needful process uh, for me personally as I'm studying. Conviction runs deep. But without conviction, there's no correction. And without correction, we continue down a course of destruction. And God has designed and desires to save us the pain that is needless and the tears that are needless. And so he's given us his word that we might walk in his ways and in so doing that we might, it doesn't exclude us from suffering or difficulty, but it, it all might be purposeful and lead to greater blessing, you see, because that's his design and desire. So we're in James chapter 3 tonight. And uh, we'll be picking it up in verse 13 of James 3. Let's pray before we begin. Lord, we uh, thank you for this time to gather into this place. And Lord, to be able to open your word. And Lord, to hear your spirit speak to our hearts. And that's what we desire, Lord. We're not wise and we are going to look at wisdom tonight and contrast the wisdom of God with the wisdom of this world. We're, we're not wise and you are. Lord, we see only part of the picture when we look at anything here in this life. You, Lord, see the whole thing. And so it's for that reason, Lord, that we ask and invite the presence and the person of your Holy Spirit as he is welcomed here, Lord, to speak to us, to open our eyes, to give us insight, to bring about not only a simply information but application to our lives that we might grow in the grace and the knowledge of you our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so God speak to us in this time thank you for this place that we can meet I thank you for those uh, Lord gifted people that are with our uh, children right now that are uh, ministering to them so we can be attentive to what you say Lord, help us to put aside any distractions or cares of the day that would in any way detract or distract from what you desire, Lord, in, in our midst tonight. And, and Lord, thank you for those that behind the scenes, the lyrics, the sound men, all those that are uh, in different places, Lord, gifted people with the video and all, Lord, that just serve you week in and week out, Lord, because they, they want to see your word go forth. Lord, bless them as well as we Open your word, Lord. Speak to us now tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, James moves on now from talking about the tongue. And we looked last time together at how it is that uh, we can bring that tongue under the control of the Holy Spirit because as we read, no man can control his tongue. You see, you can't just change your speech, uh, what it is, it's an inside job and God wants to change our hearts. And we looked at how that is done last time together. And if you uh, weren't here for us, then you can go on the internet or you can pick up the CD after the study. Uh, how many of you know what a CD is? Raise your hands if any. Any of you not know what a CD is? There's a whole generation that are growing up that will have no idea what a CD is. And so uh, anyhow, they're little discs. I'll bring out one next week maybe and show some of you that don't know. But um, we learned, you know, about how to deal with that tongue. Now James goes on and he begins by asking a question. He says, who is wise and understanding there in verse 13 among you? You see, James's whole point of his book is that we are, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, our walk should match our talk, our belief should match manifests itself in a different kind of behavior. Our words ought to be those that are bringing about godly and spiritual wisdom. You see, helping people to take the Word of God and apply it to their lives. 
You see, wisdom to the Jewish people to whom James is writing, and you remember that James is Jesus' brother, this James, and he was apparently, according to Acts, one of the, the leaders there in the church in Jerusalem, along with Peter and, and several of the other disciples. And so wisdom in the Jewish mindset was important. They realize that it's not enough to have knowledge. You need wisdom to be able to use knowledge correctly. All of us know people who are very smart, you know, very giant-brained intellectually. In fact, almost geniuses. And yet, who seemingly are unable to carry out the simplest tasks of life and deal with some of the, some of the problems that life brings their way. They, they can't cope because they've got knowledge, but they have no wisdom or little wisdom. They can run computers, but they can't manage their lives. You see, Proverbs tells us in Proverbs 4, 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. That's what we need. And listen, only God can bring about true wisdom. Knowledge enables us to take things apart, but wisdom enables us to put things together and relate God's truth to daily life. And that's what we need. That's what you and I need if we are going to live this life as God has called us to. You see, life in the natural state, it's rough, man. I mean, what do we have to offer this world but dust and death in and of ourselves. James tells us here, listen, we need more than just our thinking and logic. We need wisdom. And so he asked this question, essentially like, well, where do we get this wisdom? Who is wise and understanding among you? And he asked that question. Who among you knows what's going on when it comes to how to apply, how to apply the Word of God to daily life? Someone has said, it's an old proverb that says, a tree is best measured when it's down. The true size and quality of a tree's lumber, it's true, can be best determined after it's been cut down and felled. That's just a reality. In the same way, the true measure of a person's accomplishments can be seen at the end of his or her life. You see, a man in 2 Chronicles chapter 1 who inherited a vast kingdom from his father. God appeared to this young man in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. You can read it for your homework in a vision saying, Listen, you ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now, if God said that to you, what would you ask for? Whatever you want me to give you, you simply need ask. This man, a young man, not an old seasoned saint, but a young man. And you know what? I mean, he, he asked for something that many in their youth would not ask for. And it revealed his character when he said in Second Chronicles 1 verse 10, 
the man of course Solomon he said give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people for who can rule this great people of yours I love that God you know what it's not about me I'm not looking for uh, a position I'm not looking for you know a ma money I I'm not looking for wealth or a popularity you know what God I realize I've been handed a great responsibility to care for these people that you have entrusted to me and I need your wisdom to do that properly demonstrating great humility at that point in his life. I just want to govern your people well, and that's all I ask for and nothing more. What a demonstration of humility. You see, here we come to our text, and... In James earlier, chapter 5, you, or chapter 1, verse 5, you remember James wrote, a descendant of David, the one that writes this letter says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given. How many of us seek the Lord out for wisdom daily? You see, James says, who is wise and understanding among you? Now, I want you to note he's not looking for a show of hands. Me, me, me. You know, I mean, it's not what he's looking for. Obviously, most people reading this want to think. I mean, we all want to think. Who's wise among you? I'll bet you if I just went around and asked, you'd say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not a dummy. I'm no dummy. I may not be as wise as some, but I think I, I, think I have my act together a bit, you see. Uh, James, he is uh, making a point here. And he is uh, making an observation, and he brings in now, he brings in some marks. He brings in some distinguishing features when it comes to true wisdom and phony baloney wisdom. You see, he answers that question, who is wise among you, saying, Listen, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. You see, in other words, James is continuing on his theme. Who's wise among you? Okay, if you're so wise, if you know the Word of God, and if you can apply it to your life, then let me ask you, what are people seeing in your life? In other words, if you're wise, let it show. Let's see it. Let's put it out there. Let's demonstrate it by your good behavior. That's basically what he's saying. Let him show it by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. You see, it ought to look like you're wise. Not simply uh, spouting off wise words, but walking in a wise way. That's what he's talking about. The life of the wise person changes for the good, revealing, you see, obedience to the Word of God. Again, real faith produces works, genuine works. Smarts, degrees, and education don't make a person wise. That's what James is saying. What does make a person wise is how well his or her lifestyle reflects the truth of God. And so what, what, what's the contrast here? 
Well, he says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it's earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is pure, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see, the conduct of the wise is contrasted to the unwise here. We see the wise are gentle. One of the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23, that gentleness uh, closely related and connected to uh, another a quality that's listed there in Galatians 5, 23, and that is self-control. This meekness that he's talking about here, when he says, let him show it by good conduct, that his works are done in, meek, in the meekness of wisdom. He's not talking about a meekness that reflects, as it's been said many times, a weakness. But meekness is strength under control. The picture is that of a, a very a wild horse and strong horse that is tamed and brought under the control of the rider. And all of that strength is now harnessed, you see. That's what God wants us to be. Meekness, a lot of times we equate with weakness. But that's not the case in the scriptures. If you're looking for a good a preacher or teacher, many times we look for the wrong things. We will gravitate towards the intellectual scholar and the, uh, the seminary trained, you see, students. And the more uh, letters that he has after his name, the better. We'll look for the charismatic guy or gal. Listen, degrees and training are fine, provided they're accompanied by a lifestyle that's patterned after the truth of God's Word. That's key. Far too many credentialed teachers and eloquent preachers tend towards rash and foolish extremes. And it's interesting, you have extremes today in the church, and, and it's hard to stay in the middle. We, we tend to, you know, there, there are the extremes of the intellectual and non-charismatic and very ethereal, you know, uh, thinkers. And, and then on the other side, you've got the charismatic, and they just love Jesus, and, and they just, they, you know, excited about the Lord. And, and man, both have their place. Here, here's what we need to do. What really needs to happen is they need to get together. And the, the ones that are worshiping with all the heart love and everything, they, they need to rub off on the ones that just have the head knowledge. And, and, and man, God desires both, the head and the heart coming together and a chorus and, and a crescendo of praise to the Lord and then being able to give answers to people, to know why they believe and what they believe. You see, balance so important for us as believers. He says, listen, we need to have that quality of meekness. But if you have bitter envy, verse 14, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against the truth. 
uh, or, and, and lie against the truth rather. This wisdom does not descend from above but is earthly, sensual and demonic. And then he says, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. James now shifts gears. And in contrast to the quality of the wise person that he'll come back to, he now lays out who the unwise person in is and what he's like. And he starts off in verse 14 with two kind of heart level characteristics and, and, and they are bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. That self-seeking, that envy. Oh man, that can reap such havoc in a family. That can reap havoc in a, a workplace, you see. It can wreak havoc in the body of Christ. Bitter jealousy. And referring to hard feelings towards somebody. Uh, a person, it speaks of a person who with uh, full hands feels his or her own belongings or accomplishments are threatened by the success of another. And so they go on the attack, you see. The first thing that comes into play is that selfish ambition. To push their way to work their way to the top, to be someone, to be noted and recognized and notable. That's always a dangerous pursuit. And don't think just because you name the name of Christ that you are free from selfish ambition and jealousy. We all struggle with it from time to time, you see. It is something that is going to rear its ugly head. It's never, the enemy is never going to say, oh, you know what, I'll never try with that bitter jealousy thing. I'll never try that envy thing on him again. I'll never, I'll never try, you see, any kind of a self-seeking or a selfish ambition. No, those are things that he kind of levels and and you know what if you want to see it floating around uh, pretty freely guess where it happens I've seen it I've been there I've dealt with it you're saying I don't know why you're not that great I, I, you know what it's just the flesh the flesh is the flesh so, so you go to the pastor's conferences guess what Woo, there it is so how many services are you doing You know, how many people came to the Lord this week? Oh, hey, I got more than you. How was your budget this year? Oh, oh man, we're up. Man, we're way up. You see, that thing comes in there, that bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, a lot of pettiness. We've got to be careful of that. It happens among singers and preachers and missionaries and educators. And you know what? It's saints. And, and I'm not questioning their love for Jesus. I'm saying that the enemy tries to get in there and they're trying to move into higher positions and, and put themselves on top. They want to be the head hog at the trough, you see. And James is saying, not wise. Paul says in another place, those who compare themselves with themselves and by themselves are not wise. Walk around and saying, hey, I'm doing better than them. I mean, okay, I'm not perfect, but way I'm better than them, so look at how good I am. You see, that's a dangerous place to be. And James gives us five characteristics of counterfeit wisdom here. A wisdom that is dominated by the flesh. And that it is distinct and contradictory to the wisdom that is from above. That comes from the human heart. It's fleshly wisdom. And it does exist, that fleshly wisdom. 
He says, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Boasting. Arrogance. Justifying. Many times manifested by justifying our own sinful actions. Again, well, okay, I blew it, but I didn't blow it as bad as them. That's arrogance. I blew it, and I know what I did to you was wrong, but you know what you did to me? What I did to you is nothing compared to what you did to me. That's contrary to God-inspired humility. Charles Hodge, one of the reformers and co uh, Bible commentators, said this, The Bible doctrine concerning man is eminently adapted to make him what he was designed to be, to exalt without inflating, to humble without degrading. Watch out for arrogance. It can creep in there. And boasting. Another thing that we see here, the second thing out of the five, is lying against the truth. Regardless of what anybody says, there is a standard that God has set down in His Word that is immovable. No matter what your postmodern concepts of relative truth are, and we have them today, don't we? Well, it's, that's your truth, man. My truth is different than your truth. Uh, listen, we can't play fast and loose with the Word of God. God has given us His Word. Jesus said, I am not a way. He said what? I am the way. I am a truth. No, he didn't say, I am a truth, one among many. He didn't say that. He said, I am the truth. The I am God himself, Jesus Christ, said, I am the truth. If you want to know the truth of God, you need to get into the Word of God and read and look at and behold the truth of God. I am the truth and I am the life. In other words, I think that's pretty clear that if you're going to be a Christian and name the name of Christ, if you're going to follow Jesus, you aren't following a religion and a bunch of rules. You are following the truth and it is a narrow path, saints. It is a narrow path and increasingly unpopular in our world that is saying, hey man, whatever feels good, do it in a way like it's never said before. Whatever you think is right is right. Accept it. You see, Jesus doesn't allow for that. The truth is the truth. And he's very clear here about lying against it. It is it is the wisdom of this world that comes against it and, and believes the lies, makes up its own truth to match their standards. Since when does truth automatically, if we say it and speak it in love, automatically make us haters? But the world is is there, is, aren't they? Increasingly. Just because I don't agree, I believe the Word of God teaches clearly same-sex marriage is sin, adultery is sin, fornication is sin. You see, all those sexual things that are outside the marriage between a man and a woman are outside of God's will. Period. End of story. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to mistreat. I'm not going to curse 
It's somebody that's caught up in any of those sins. I'm not going to be unloving towards them and unkind towards them. But if they say, well, you say it's wrong, you're a hater. No, I say it's wrong because it's not me that's saying it. I have a Bible that I believe. I believe what Jesus said. I believe the Word of God is the truth. And so it's not my message. It's His. I'm just the message boy. I'm just bringing it. And I happen to believe it. What's the matter with that? You don't want to know. You see, the reason I believe personally for such rebellion is because it is, in fact, the truth and there's an inner conviction and they want us to say it's okay. The adulterer wants us to say it's okay. The, the person having an affair wants to say, wants to believe it's okay. The person, you know, the same sex, they want to believe, go ahead, tell me it's okay so I can feel like it's okay because inside, deep inside, there's a conviction. Just a conviction. This is, this is not right. Sex sin is sex sin no matter how or where or, you know, when it takes place. It is what it is. It's not discrimination against one person or one such circumstance. It's, it's sin according to God. And that, 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 that's the bad news. The good news is, is guess what? You don't have to stay there. There's a God who loves you who sent his son to die on the cross to pay for that sin that you could be forgiven. And he can change your life. We have people going to this church whom God has changed their lives. And they've come out of that background. I have a good friend that's come out of that background. You see, we love them, but that does not leave us to say it's okay. So, so you see, people want to change the Word of God to match their lifestyles. They want to take and pick and choose which part of the Bible that we should believe. And I'll tell you what, I used to be a baker. I was a baker for many years. When you're a baker, the goal is to make a consistent product. So that every time a person comes in to buy that chocolate chip cookie, it tastes just as good as it did two months ago when they bought seven dozen chocolate chip cookies. They want to be able to buy another and take it to their friend and have it taste just as good. So here's the goal of the baker, to get it consistent so that every time somebody buys a cookie, it tastes the same. When you have that kind of demand, you have a formula that you follow. If you follow that formula carefully, guess what happens? Consistency of product. You get fast and loose with that formula. I'm making chocolate chip cookies. The formula calls for, you know, uh, 20 pounds of, of flour, cookie flour, and I use bread flour. It calls for, you know, a 7 to 10 pounds of, of well, it would call for a lot more sugar than, than that. But, but let's say it calls for 20 pounds of sugar, and I say, you know what, I, I'm going to put, I'm only going to put 5 pounds of sugar in it, and then it calls, you know, for a certain amount of chocolate chips. Well, you know what? I can put that all in a bowl, and I can mix it all together because I don't like lines, man. I just want to be free to create. Be creative. Don't follow formulas. Guess what? You know what's going to happen? I can mix it up. And I can believe all day long that these are going to be the best chocolate chip cookies anybody's ever had. And when I put them on the pan, they may even look like, oh, these are going to be good. 
And when I pull them out of the oven, they may look amazing. But when I go to bite into one, if the ratio of sugar and flour and shortening and chocolate chips and baking soda are not right, guess what? They are not going to taste like the chocolate chip cookie that people are used to. You see, you can pick and choose whatever Bible verses you want and you can leave out certain parts, but know this, what you're going to get as a result is a mess. You're not going to get the truth as God has set it forth. You need the whole thing. You're not free, I'm not free to pick and choose and make up my own truth. You don't want anybody doing that with your bank account at the bank. If you went to a bank that says, you know, we want to play with your money a little bit. I know you deposited $20, but we're, this week we're only depositing 15 of that to your account. The rest of it goes to bank charges. And then the following week, you know, they only deposit, you know, five, and then the 10 goes to the bank charges. And, you know, but then the next week they put 20 in. You're, you're, ah, you never know where you're at. Un instability. And no security because there's no consistency. That's why we're in such a mess as a nation. What is truth? Pilate said. The sad thing is, is he didn't hang around and wait for a response. What is truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father, the Creator, but by me. You can lie against the truth all you want and that's what the wisdom of this world does. They want to push it away and put it out and pick and choose. Designer truth. That's what the wisdom of the world offers. They lie. They believe a lie. Third thing we see here is uncontrolled zeal. Uncontrolled zeal. Lying against the truth and just making it up and being all excited about it, but don't bother me with the facts. Don't bother me with the reality. Let's just have fun and party. There are Christians like that. In the worship service, all kinds of weird stuff is going on. Don't bother me with the truth. We're excited. We're passionate. Watch out for that kind of attitude, you see, because that leads people down a path of deception that, well, that's going to create serious problems. And even, even when we come, when it comes to sharing our faith, you know what? Uh, precious saints, we need to lovingly share the truth with people. We don't need to be, you know, beat them to death with the Bible. Sometimes we do that. We beat them to death with God's Word. And we, we have the attitude, I'm here with an attitude, not of humility, but of boasting again, and, and, and then going out there and just beating people with the truth of God. We need to be careful that we don't take part in that. People need to know that you care about them. Not just that you're, you know, the, otherwise you fall in the, the same category, the salesman. Oh, here, here comes the guy, that, the pressure. He's always preaching when he comes. He's always preaching. He's preaching. He's preaching. He's preaching. But you know what? He's just preaching. He's talking. It's a dialogue. It's a monologue with just himself always preaching and getting all preachy and, and trying to get me in a corner and always hitting me with the questions and then trying to make me look like I'm an idiot. And you know what? I don't care about this guy. I don't even want to hear about his Jesus because you know what? He doesn't really care about me. He's just, 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 I, I'm just a, just a face to him. Be careful of that. We can become that way where people become a project rather than showing them compassion. We get all excited and all fired up and I'm going to go witness to somebody and we pounce on somebody. It's been said 
Howie Hendricks said, they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Remember that. Every time you're sharing with somebody, do I, and, and that's the question I think, and I, it's not a question that you just should flippantly answer. When I share with this person, do I really care about this person? Is that why I'm doing it? Or am I just doing it because, well, you know, we're out on street witnessing and so we're, we're supposed to share, so we need to find out a bunch of people. And, uh, God, give me a heart of compassion. Because you're not going to reach them with preaching if there's no compassion and love and care, genuine care for them. I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible to care for those on the street. It is. But we need to really say, God, search my heart. I don't want to be out here just, you know, carving notches in my... I witnessed 20 people, you know what, and seven of them accepted the Lord. And I, yeah, I win. Uh, no, that shouldn't be the case. You really show the love of God whether they accepted the Lord or not, did you show the love of God to those seven people? Do they know you care about them? Did you succeed there? Third thing here is the wisdom of this world is, is earthy. It says here in verse 15, the wisdom does, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthy, sensual, and demonic. That word earthy means of the earth. And James is contrasting it with the wisdom that is from above. The wisdom of the earth is purely on the horizontal perspective. Worldly wisdom measures truth by earthly standards of success, material motives, temporal priorities, and impact, you see. Again, we can get into that thing with the numbers game. How big's your church? How big's yours? How big's your budget? How big's yours? My budget's bigger than your budget. My church is bigger than your church. I make more money than you. And you know what? The measure of success is marred. That's the earthly standards. That has never been, which is why Jesus had a problem with the disciples whenever, you remember in John's Gospel chapter 6, he had this giant crowd of people that he fed the day before and then they got hungry again and they got, they had free food the day before so they got hungry again so guess what? They looked up Jesus again because it was about lunchtime. So I mean, they, they made it through breakfast, but now it's lunchtime. So they're looking up Jesus, and they finally find out where he's at. And so this huge crowd is gathered around. And they dialogue with Jesus. Are you really the Son of God? Show us. Prove to us you're the Son of God. And then they go on to suggest how he proved to them that he was the Son of God. Now, understand the day before he had fed them miraculously there out where there was no restaurants and that kind of a thing. And they were, they were overfilled. I mean, there were leftovers taken up. The next day they say, well, Moses gave us bread in the wilderness. In other words, I think you get the picture. He's, they're implying if uh, you are really God, you'll give us more food. What did Jesus do? I had the giant crowd. I mean, this was the biggest crowd he had ever had to date. The disciples are impressed. They're thinking, man, success, this kingdom building stuff is happening. And finally, Jesus, our Messiah, is getting the credit and recognition and the, having the impact he deserves. We've always known that. It's looking good for us. And then Jesus turned to them and he said, If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. What? What? That's gross. 
we're gone. And the crowd left, apparently all but the disciples. And the Lord said, so are you guys going to go too? And Peter, God bless Peter. We relate to him because he said some wrong things. But boy, there's times where he said some right things. He said, where else would we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. You see, the crowd was gone. But Jesus never came simply to draw a crowd. He came to provide life to die on the cross that's what he was speaking of that's why he goes on there in the gospel of John and he says the words that I speak to you they are spirit these things are spiritual I'm not talking literally eating my flesh and drinking my blood like some have translated that these things are spiritual in other words I, I want committed people who are willing to go through and live the life I've called them to You see, and that's, that's a commitment. That's sacrifice. Listen, popularity in the crowds, if that's why you're preaching, man, you're, you're going you're gonna to be up with the crowd and down with the, when they diminish. And they come and go. I've been around long enough to know. Some of you that have been around this church for a while, you've seen it jam-packed, and then you've seen it kind of lighten up and you see it jam back and you see it lighten up I mean uh, they come and they go if you're preaching to raise a crowd you're preaching for the wrong reasons start a circus get, go into show business you know I, you can get a crowd do some song and dance put off a little fireworks ask Walt Walt Disney and the boys down there they know how to get a crowd there's all kinds of ways to get a crowd. Is that the goal? That is never and should never be the goal. But see, that's the world's measure of success. And so, listen, we all, flesh-wise, how much money do you make? I make, you know, 500000 a year. I mean, wouldn't you love to say that? Some of you may be able to say that. God bless you. But the guy that makes, you know, 20000 a year, God loves him just as much and God can work and use through him and use him in a dynamic way and a power. So you see, God doesn't measure success. World, the world measures success by the wrong standard. And that's basically what he's saying. This is earthly. The wisdom of the world is earthly. It's measured. Everything, everything is on the horizontal. It measures truth. Everything is on the horizontal. Hey, man, if you gotta, if you gotta tell the lie to uh, to keep from the truth, to keep things going and things mellow, man, just go ahead and lie. You know, it, it plays fast and loose with all of it. And the the priority is on the temporal, isn't it? Whatever looks good, feels good, seems good at the time. Hey, do it, man. Don't make problems. Don't, don't take the tough road. Take the easy road. Take the path of least resistance. That's earthly wisdom. It's earthly. It's sensual or, or it's, you know, it's, it's something that, 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 that it's feeling, totally feeling oriented. It's, it's natural, you see. It's, it's organic. It's holistic. It's that kind of wisdom. It's soulish. It's in our own thoughts and attitude and interests and pursuits and not necessarily frequently, in fact, not going along with the things of the Spirit. It is demonic. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the wisdom of the worldly wisdom comes straight from demonic beings though in uh, some cases that may be the case but the emphasis here is on wisdom that reflects a philosophy or a, a ideology or a pattern of thinking so contrary to God's truth that Satan himself could endorse it demons have doctrines they have teachings 
They have philosophies and ideologies that they're setting forth, you see. Satan himself could endorse. And I'm certain does endorse the acts of the terrorists. Why do I know that he endorses them? Because they're murderous acts. Senseless, murderous acts. Just un... un you know... They don't have any kind of target from any personal thing. They just go about destroying masses of people for their, because of their ideology. Who is, who is a murderer and has been a murderer from the beginning? Who's the liar and has been a liar from the beginning? Who is it that, that he knows he's on his way to hell and his goal, take everybody he can with him. Satan himself. It's demonic. We are living, as the Word of God says, in satanically energized times. A kind of murderous, wholesale destruction of human lives without any regard and, and not caring whether it's children or, or whatever. They're just willing to blow themselves up. Who wants you to destroy yourself? The enemy. He wants to destroy your life. He hates you. And he has a horrible plan for your life. And he wants to fulfill that plan. You see, the wisdom of this world is demonic as well and then of course the resulting outcome is in verse 16 for where envy and self-seeking confusion and everything uh, are there um, but wisdom that is from above is first gentle gentle and peaceable I'm, I'm doing the King James here I, I memorized this passage years ago let me let me read the text here so I don't get into that but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle and willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy you see the wisdom of this world breeds certain and brings about certain outcomes, certain responses. When there's envy, self-seeking, and, and self-seeking, and we live for self, and we live for, oh, he's got one, I deserve one, he's got that, I deserve that. If You know what, whatever they've got, I want, and so I'm going to get it for me. It's, uh, I need mine too, and, and, and how come it's not fair if they got one and I don't got one? And if we live like that and for that, then the outcome, it says here, is very clear. Here's what we can expect. Confusion and every evil thing. Hey, guess what? News flash. Do we need to search too far to see if this is true? Where are we living right now? I mean, we are living in a generation that has licensed every evil thing like has never been in the history of this country. We, we, we want to approve it. We want to license it. We want to say there's, there's no evil thing when the reality is, is, is the things that we are caught up in. And there, there is every evil thing. Everything that God calls evil, that the Bible says is evil, guess what? We're out there licensing increasingly and bragging about that. And thus, confusion. Yeah, when you have no standard of right and wrong, how do you have justice? How is it that you can possibly maintain fairness when there's no standard of what's right and what's wrong? You see, when we all live for ourselves with our own standards, with our own things, and there's no 
definition, there's no clarity as to what's right and wrong, then confusion and uh, craziness, uh, you know, self-seeking, that, that's what happens, that confusion and every evil thing are there, that you're going to find this growing. We've seen evil things like we've not seen. I'm not saying never seen in history. Obviously, we've seen Hitler did some pretty radical things. History is littered with people who have done evil things. But the kind of wholesale things that we are approving as, as okay, as good, I mean, just kind of, it, it's gone crazy in recent years. But that's where the wisdom of this world gets us. Again, you know what? You look at the book of Judges. If you want to read it for your homework and see what was going on in the nation of Israel at a time when every man was doing what he thought not was wrong, but was right in his own eyes. It is the most perverse, the most evil, the most murderous. Uh, it, it's a horrible time and a mark on the history of the nation. I believe we are living in a horrible time as a nation, as we license so much that is against God and against the truth of His Word. But that's where the world's wisdom always leads. It's demonic. And, and, uh, and it creates confusion and antagonism and pettiness. I'm getting so petty about everything. I mean, I'm going to sue you for any and everything. I mean, I don't like the way you looked at me. I'm suing you. You know, I mean, okay, let's go. You know, I mean, and, and sometimes, I mean, I, 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 come, I have people come in and, and the divorce, I, well, we, we don't want to be together anymore. We're just not getting along. And, and when you nail it down, when you sort through all of it, uh, the things are so petty. And that's where we've come as a result of following the wisdom of men. Not an example to follow. Having described the wisdom from below very straightforwardly and honestly, James ends with a stark contrast when he talks about the wisdom from above. And he lays it out very clearly. And what a refreshing word this is from James that we're not going to get to tonight. I hate to leave you in the desert. <laughs> but you're living in a desert. So maybe the feel, the weight of that for a week will kind of sink in. And then it'll be so refreshing next week when we get into the wisdom that is from above. Well, that's what God wants us to enjoy and employ. It's what He wants us to have. I'll just read it and then we'll comment next time because I just can't leave you in the desert. <laughs> Got to give you some hope. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Oh, not polluted. Pure. Then peaceable. Brings peace. Then gentle. Oh, how, how harsh we've become. How cynical and critical. Willing to yield. Oh, I'm, my rights. Oh, that's not the way the wisdom from above is. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who what? Make peace. You hear the cry, we need peace. There's only one way to get it. And that is to get wisdom from above. That's the only way it can be brought. So we'll look in more detail at that next time together. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you again, as always, for your word. And Lord, uh, just that you, uh, Lord, have been so and continue to be so faithful, Lord, to teach and instruct and direct and bring application and, and revelation to us as your children. And God, I pray that as we hear these things, again, Lord, as always, 
Just as James has been stressing that we would uh, not simply hear and know them and comprehend them intellectually, but again, that these things would be applied to our lives and that we would grow daily. Lord, that we would uh, be those who demonstrate uh, increasing maturity as your uh, children, that you might receive the honor and the glory, that we might show and demonstrate to the watching world Lord who Jesus is it's our desire Lord and I know it's yours that people see Jesus and so Lord may we die to ourselves and may we submit our lives to you may we know you and may we grow in you as we apply that knowledge wisely to our lives daily in Jesus name we pray Amen. Let's all stand. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. God didn't give me that gift because I'd be, I'd be proud if I had <laughs> It'd be hard to be humble and be that good. So anyhow, God gives us gifts as, as he wills for our benefit and blessing because he knows what we can handle, right? And he won't give us more than we can handle. But in heaven, where there's no boasting or pride, I'm going to be able to play like that. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Have